Welcome to Public Health IT. This will be a lecture on biosurveillance. The learning objectives for the biosurveillance unit are, number one, describe traditional means used to monitor and report on disease spread within a community. Number two, define syndromic surveillance. Number three, identify current data sources used to track disease. Number four, identify strengths and weaknesses of using EHRs for biosurveillance. Number five, describe process for monitoring, reporting, and analyzing EHR biosurveillance data. And six, identify how current and future findings from EHR biosurveillance improve public health operations and services. The definition of biosurveillance was recently modified by the International Society for Disease Surveillance, ISDS, as the collection and integration of timely health-related information for public health action achieved through the early detection, characterization, and situation awareness of exposures and acute human health events of public health significance. Traditionally, disease surveillance occurred through the healthcare providers manually reporting diseases and health conditions to the health department. Case definitions exist to define who was included as a case or as having the disease or health condition of interest. The Center for Disease Control provides case definitions for reportable diseases. The example on the right shows the CDC website's current case definition for Legionellis. All healthcare providers are required to notify the health department of patients with reportable diseases, as well as of observed disease clusters. Manual disease reporting historically has low compliance. Manual reporting is typically a slow process, as it often relies on laboratory confirmation. However, this does not mean that traditional surveillance is not important or should eventually get replaced with technological improvements. The NYC Department of Health was first made aware of the presence of H1N1 in New York City when a school nurse reported that there were many students with influenza-like illness. Laboratory confirmations of suspected illnesses are often necessary to make a firm diagnosis. There is limited in-house testing available for some tests, such as the rapid flu tests. The test results are available within a few minutes and can be given back to the patient at the time of visit. However, many tests, especially those requiring a higher level of accuracy, must be done at a commercial laboratory. It may take several days or even weeks to get lab test results back from a commercial laboratory, which reduces the timeliness of disease reporting. Traditional reporting of diseases can be labor-intensive. As you can see from the example below of NYC Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Universal Reporting Form, there are many fields that must be filled out by the healthcare provider and then sent back to the health department. This task alone can be labor-intensive. On this slide is an example of how diseases are reported to the Department of Health. We will now start discussing the difference between syndromic surveillance from traditional surveillance. Syndromic surveillance monitors pre-diagnostic indicators of disease. Syndromic surveillance grew in popularity in response to the readiness of any bioterrorism threats and pandemic outbreaks. Syndromic surveillance aims to perform timely, sensitive, and specific surveillance, and ideally will detect outbreaks before an astute clinician. The typical process is described in this diagram. First, data is collected. For example, an electronic health record system captures data, of which select information is then sent to the health department. The health department processes and codes the data into syndromes. A baseline must be established in order to tell what the normal level of the syndrome is in the population. A statistically significant increase above the baseline allows an epidemiologist to identify an outbreak. After identifying an outbreak, the epidemiologist would then sound an alarm by notifying relevant members of the community, such as clinicians, school nurses. Syndromic surveillance has expanded to encompass a variety of new data types. Medication sales, for example, the number of cold medicines sold daily, 
are used as an indicator for presence of influenza-like illness in a community. We say that the level of data is aggregate, or summarized, because each row of data gives a count of the number of sales of a particular type of medication. Individual level data means the data comes with each row representing an individual's information. School absences are another example of aggregate, preclinical, pre-diagnostic syndromic surveillance data. Nurse hotline calls, emergency room chief complaints, primary care reasons for visits, EMS calls, temperatures taken in a clinical setting, radiology reports, and chest x-rays are all forms of individual level syndromic surveillance data taken at the pre-diagnostic stage. Diagnostic phase data includes diagnosis codes and text taken from progress notes. The Primary Care Information Project at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene uses a number of different EHR data sources to conduct and pilot its syndromic surveillance activities. Some of the syndromes tracked using EHR data are influenza-like illness, ILI, fever and gastrointestinal illness, GI. Case definitions for these syndromes are based upon text in the following structured fields, chief complaint, measured temperature, and diagnosis, ICD-9 code. Here is an example of what the electronic health record would look like. Notice that this patient has a chief complaint of cough and fever, which are two key words that the syndromic surveillance system would search for as part of the influenza-like illness case definition. If the patient's record meets the case definition for a particular syndrome, for example, influenza-like illness, then that patient will be counted as a case. Syndromic surveillance data is often collected on the aggregate level, that is, only count data is collected. Here is an example of what the aggregate syndromic file looks like. There are identifying columns for the facility from which the information came, a numeric and text identifier for the measure or syndrome, the date and the age group. The patient numerator column represents how many cases there were of the given syndrome for the given facility, date, and age group. The patient denominator column represents the total number of patients seen, regardless of whether they were positively identified as cases. Benefits to using aggregate data are that it inherently protects patient confidentiality. We may know there is one case, but we do not know who that person was. Aggregate data is also simple to use. There is no need for epidemiologists to do additional programming. On the other side of the coin, Aggregate data can be difficult to validate for accuracy, and it may be difficult to get more information on a case when it is needed, for example, when the epidemiologist is conducting an investigation. Coding case definitions often entail scanning free text fields, such as chief complaint slash reason for visit, for keywords indicative of particular health condition. Since there are an infinite number of ways to record a particular health condition in a free text field, programming must be done to try to find the likely cases. The code here is taken from NYC DOHMH's syndromic macro, which attempts to capture as many different ways a respiratory condition might appear in the chief complaint field. For example, it might appear as cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, or URI for upper respiratory infection misspellings must be coded, as well as variations and abbreviations. Before doing an analysis to look for an outbreak or increase in level of disease, you first must know what the baseline or expected levels of diseases are. There are many different ways to estimate baseline. A simple moving average can be calculated to see what the average level of disease was in the preceding days. A seven-day moving average is commonly used. Regression methods may be used to adjust for things like day of week, seasons, current weather, etc. Complex time series methods, such as autoregressive models, exist that can be tailored to best detect different types of outbreaks and adjust for day-to-day -day correlation of observed disease levels. Long-term and short-term adjustments to the baseline are often necessary. Long-term adjustments might be for seasonal trends. For example, Influenza levels are higher during the winter. Secular trends, in other words, whether the overall level of a disease is increasing or decreasing over time. Environmental, such as outdoor temperature or pollen levels, which affect asthma activity. 
Short-term adjustments are done for the day of week, weekends, holidays, and reporting failures. After establishing a baseline, the next step is to compare the observed level with the baseline or expected level. Statistical significance testing is used to determine whether the observed level significantly differs from the baseline level. Usually, this is done by setting a predetermined number of standard deviations. When the observed level is greater than the statistical threshold, it is referred to as a signal, which then may be investigated further. Here is an example of some EHR syndromic data during the spring 2009 H1N1 outbreak. The vertical axis represents the percent of all patients meeting the case definition for influenza-like illness. The horizontal axis represents time. The blue line shows the expected number of cases, which in this example is based on a seasonal regression. The red lines show the upper and lower thresholds, which in this case are a 95% confidence interval around the expected values. The observed level of the syndrome is plotted each week in green. You can see that there was a sharp increase in the disease level, and for three weeks the observed level of influenza-like illness was above the expected threshold. There are several challenges to detecting outbreaks. The accuracy of a surveillance system is how well it can detect outbreaks when they occur with a minimal number of false alarms. Accuracy can be measured by seeing how well a system performs during an actual outbreak, which may be too late or too rarely occurring to provide a good measure of accuracy. As an alternative, statisticians can create many simulations of outbreaks in the data and measure the accuracy of the system in detecting outbreaks that way. The type, size, and timeliness of an outbreak affect how easy it is to detect. As you might expect, surge outbreaks, when many people present with symptoms all at once, are easier to detect than slower building outbreaks. Smaller outbreaks are of course harder to detect than larger outbreaks. For most outbreaks, especially those that are spread by human-to-human -human infection, it is more difficult to detect the outbreak earlier, since fewer people are infected then later in the outbreak. We are now going to transition to how the Department of Health utilized electronic health record surveillance during the 2009 H1N1 pandemic in New York City. This set of maps demonstrates the increase in ILI, influenza-like illness, across NYC in May 2009, based on EHR syndromic surveillance data. The red dots represent ambulatory clinics participating in an EHR syndromic surveillance system. Larger dots represent higher proportions of ILI at the facility. The smallest of the dots are facilities with less than 4% of patient visits related to influenza-like illnesses, ILI. The largest dot represents facilities with over 20% of patients with ILI. The graph on the left-hand side shows the epidemic curve, in blue, and the day of the graph is indicated by the black vertical bar. This map shows the distribution of ILI in NYC on Friday, May 15th. This map shows the distribution of ILI in NYC on Saturday, May 16th. This map shows the distribution of ILI in NYC on Sunday, May 17th. Being Sunday, many clinics were closed. Then on Monday, May 18th, we see many more clinics with a large number, over 20% ILI. Tuesday, May 19th. Even more on Wednesday, the 20th. Thursday, the 21st, Friday, the 22nd, Saturday, the 23rd, Sunday, the 24th, not many clinics open, but almost all have a high level of ILI. Monday, the 25th, this was Memorial Day, so we see only a few clinics open. Tuesday the 26th, again, lots of ILI all over the city. Retrospectively, a research project was conducted to compare 
the existing emergency department syndromic surveillance system with the newer primary care electronic health record syndromic surveillance system. The main objective was to determine where patients sought treatment during H1N1, emergency departments or primary care clinics. Specifically, to determine whether the timing of the increase in patient visits was different at emergency departments from primary care clinics during the spring 2009 H1N1 influenza outbreak across the five boroughs of New York City. The study sites included in the analysis were 58 primary care practices, 9 from the Institute for Family Health, IFH, and 49 practices enrolled in the NYC DOHMH Primary Care Information Project. These were generally small practices, averaging about 30 visits a day. 50 emergency room departments were included in the analysis, averaging about 250 visits a day. Looking at the map to your right, you can see that the primary care practices and the EDs were similarly distributed across the five boroughs of New York City. The influenza-like illness, ILI syndrome, was used as a broad estimate of actual H1N1 cases. The case definitions for ILI were similar between the facilities, but differed slightly. At the primary care practices, ILI was defined as a fever plus a respiratory-related reason for visit or diagnosis. At the EDs, ILI was defined as a chief complaint of a fever plus either a sore throat or cough or a chief complaint of flu. The number of days of a significant increase in ILI at EDs and primary care practices were compared using a log rank test, which takes into account the fact that not all of the facilities experienced an increase. The comparison was done on a citywide level and repeated by borough to see if there were geographic differences, since the outbreak began in the borough of Queens. The analysis was done for two waves of the outbreak the first being the initial wave between April 24th and May 8th. During this time, there was a lot of media coverage of the outbreak, but health officials suspected that relatively few people were truly sick. The second wave analyzed was between May 14th and June 4th. During this phase, it seemed that many more people were truly getting sick. Here is a graph of the level of ILI at the emergency departments in red, the PCIP primary care practices in green, and the IFH primary care practices in blue. From this graph, it appears that EDs increased well above its baseline around 428, whereas IFH didn't increase above baseline until after 519, and the PCIP facilities didn't show a major increase until mid-May. In the first phase of the outbreak, 424 to 58, most EDs, 86%, experienced significant increases in ILI almost immediately, whereas the increase in ILI at ambulatory care facilities occurred in fewer sites, only 62%, and was more gradual. The median days to increase at EDs was four days. In other words, 50% of EDs experienced an increase in ILI within four days of April 24th. At the primary care practices, the median days to increase in ILI was 12 days, it wasn't until 12 days after April 24th when primary care practices experienced an increase in ILI. The log rank test was highly significant, P less than 1 100,000th, meaning that the increase in ILI experienced by the ED statistically significantly earlier than that at the primary care practices. You can see that the pattern is similar for the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Queens, with the EDs experiencing an increase before the primary care practices. Staten Island did not follow the same pattern, but this is at least partly because there were fewer facilities in the borough. A similar pattern emerged during the second phase. Almost all EDs, 94%, experienced significant increase in ILI almost immediately, and again the increase in ILI at ambulatory care facilities occurred in fewer sites, 86%, and was more gradual. The median days to increase at EDs was four days, that is, 50% of EDs experienced an increase in ILI within four days of May 14th. At the primary care practices, the median days to increase in ILI was eight days. The log rank test was highly significant, P less than 1 100,000th, 
meaning that the increase in ILI experienced by the ED statistically significantly earlier than that at the primary care practices. This time, the pattern was similar across all five of the boroughs, with the EDs experiencing an increase in ILI before the primary care practices. The study found that emergency departments experienced an increase in patients with ILI before primary care providers. Primary care providers were vastly underutilized during the outbreak. As a consequence, NYCDO HMH changed messaging to encourage visiting PCPs instead of EDs for mild illness. The field of biosurveillance has been growing alongside the expansion of electronic health records and data sharing. As part of meaningful use requirements for EHR reimbursements, providers may send syndromic surveillance data to local health departments. This will provide many more health departments with electronic health record syndromic surveillance data. Syndromic surveillance is also expanding to make use of regional health information organizations, RHIOs, and other hubs that connect an individual's health information across providers and facilities. However, an increased reliance on electronic data requires the incoming data to be accurate and of good quality. The New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene have used biosurveillance systems to track disease outbreaks like H1N1 using EHR datasets. Operationally, this represents a new workflow from traditional paper-based reporting requirements for health departments requiring new analytic procedures. Meaningful use legislation now requires EHR vendors to send syndromic data as required by local health departments.